It's summer 1945. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries is developing a new oil tanker in Hiroshima with high hopes for a brighter future. The young and ambitious engineer, Tosumu Yamaguchi, has put his heart and soul into this project. He spent the last three months in Hiroshima, but his thoughts were at home. The engineer constantly thought of how he would finally embrace his wife, Hisako, and take his son, Katsutoshi, in his arms. August 6, 1945, was to be his final day on the job. At 8.15, the 29-year-old went to the Mitsubishi shipyard to settle his final bit of business, and almost immediately, the engineer heard an unusually loud sound. He looked up and realized that the hum was coming from a plane. It was an American B-29 bomber. Yamaguchi looked at it closely and noticed a small object parachuting down from it. Yamaguchi did not know yet what it was, but suspecting something was wrong, he jumped into the ditch. The sky was flooded with a bright flash of light, which the engineer called magnesium for some reason. After this blinding flash, there was a powerful crash, and then a shockwave followed. It threw the engineer out of hiding, and like a tornado, swirled him in the air. Yamaguchi fell into a nearby potato field. For some reason, he lost consciousness. When the engineer came to his senses and looked up, the sky was not visible. Clouds of dust and debris completely covered the sun, as if night had fallen. Endless streams of ash fell on Yamaguchi from above. At that moment, the engineer did not yet realize that his face and hands were badly burned and both eardrums had burst. The only thing the engineer could clearly see was a giant, glowing mushroom-shaped cloud. The parachuted object was a uranium atomic bomb, affectionately called Little Boy by the Americans. It exploded less than two miles from where Yamaguchi was. The engineer went back to the Mitsubishi shipyard and was horrified to find that only ruins remained of it. There he met two of his shocked employees, Akira Awagana and Kinyoshi Sato. They too miraculously survived. The next night, Yamaguchi and his colleagues waited in a bomb shelter without realizing what had happened. In the morning, they got out and saw the atomicized city in front of their eyes. All buildings were destroyed, charred, and melted bodies of Hiroshima's residents lay on the streets of the city. The surviving engineers had to cross to the other side of the river, but they did not find a single surviving bridge. It would be necessary to get across by swimming. Yamaguchi went down into the river, but it was literally inundated with dead people, and there was almost no open water to be seen. Therefore, in order to reach the opposite shore, the engineer had to wade through a whole layer of charred corpses. Surprisingly, the local train station was still working. The engineer got on a train and went to his hometown, Nagasaki. On August 8th, Yamaguchi arrived home. The engineer first of all went to his doctor friend, who he used to study with, but he did not immediately recognize Yamaguchi due to the fact that his face was completely black from burns. The family also did not recognize their relative, already wrapped in bandages. Yamaguchi's mother mistook him for a ghost. They did not yet know about the tragedy in Hiroshima. No matter how terrible the state of the Japanese is, work for him always remains the most important part of life. Therefore, on August 9th, the engineer went to the local branch of the Mitsubishi company. At 11 in the morning, he stood in the office of the chief, who was demanding a detailed report on the work in Hiroshima. The boss didn't yet believe Yamaguchi's words. He thought the engineer was just crazy. How is it possible for just one bomb to turn a large city into a mountain of ash? However, their conversation did not last long. The work meeting was suddenly interrupted by a bright white flash. The office windows shattered into pieces, and the whole room was filled with rubbish and dust. At that moment, Yamaguchi thought that the mushroom cloud from Hiroshima was following him, because at that time, he didn't know what caused such clouds. The shockwave tore the bandages off the engineer's face, and his body was hit with a new batch of scalding radiation. The landscape in Nagasaki was hilly. Combined with the reinforced staircase of the Mitsubishi office, it slightly muffled the explosion, which allowed the engineer to survive this time. Although the plutonium bomb dropped on Nagasaki was much more powerful, and Yamaguchi was again less than two miles from the epicenter of the explosion, when the engineer recovered somewhat, the first thought that crossed his mind was whether his family was still alive. The engineer ran out of what was left of the Mitsubishi building like a bullet. This time, the burning ruins and mountains of molten bodies did not bother him. He only thought of his wife and son. Upon reaching his destination, Yamaguchi, with a cold heart, found the ruins at the place where his house stood. The engineer was sure that he had lost all the people close to him. But here, too, he was lucky. His family was not home at the time of the disaster. Yamaguchi's wife was in town with her five-month-old son, looking for burn ointment for her husband. When the atomic shell fell, the girl and her baby were just in an underground tunnel. It didn't save them from radiation, but it allowed them to survive. 
It turns out that if Yamaguchi had not been in Hiroshima on August 6, it is likely that his family would not have survived in Nagasaki. Together with his family, the engineer went to the bomb shelter, where they stayed until August 15, the day the Japanese emperor, Hirohito, announced his surrender. The young family left the shelter and tried to return to normal life, but it wasn't easy. While the family was in hiding, Yamaguchi's hair fell out, the burns gradually turned into gangrene, and all this was accompanied by constant vomiting and fever. Yamaguchi could not eat, drink, or even sleep. There was no doubt in his mind that he was about to die. However, the demise was far from as swift as the injured engineer had imagined. Yamaguchi, as well as his family, began to make a gradual recovery. To make a living, he got a job as a translator for the U.S. military, which held Japan under occupation until 1952. Then he taught at a school for a while. After that, Yamaguchi resumed his activities as an engineer at Mitsubishi. In 1948, a daughter, Toshiko, was born to the Yamaguchi family. And in the early 50s, another girl, Nayako, appeared. They were born healthy, without any defects, although no one believed that after the experience of the bombing and the shock dose of radiation, one can generally count on children being okay. Naoko and Toshiko themselves noted that in childhood, they were sick more often than other children. Nevertheless, even years later, genetic testing did not reveal any defects in DNA or a tendency to form cancer. True, the oldest son, who was five months old at the time of the tragedy, suffered more. He died of cancer at the age of 58, while his parents were still alive. It is obvious that the disease was a result of the received dose of radiation. Until the 2000s, Tosumu Yamagachi refused to go public. He did not give interviews and did not want to tell anything or anyone. Probably the death of his eldest son forced him to change his attitude towards what he had experienced. He began to write his memoirs, in which he set out all of his memories of terrible events of the 40s. In 2006, he arrived in New York, where he spoke to the UN on the dangers of atomic weapons. In the same year, the documentary with Yamaguchi was released called Twice Survived, the double atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Tasumu Yamaguchi turned out to be far from unique in his case. Colleagues of the engineer with whom he left Hiroshima, Akira Avanga and Kiniyoshi Sato, also survived after two bombs. A local kite maker named Singoshi Morimoto, was half a mile from the crash site, who was half a mile from the crash site, also survived. Total survivors from the two deadly attacks, according to various estimates, were from 70 to 160 people. However, the Japanese authorities officially recognized only Tosumu Yamagachi as Niyu Abakushu, which means twice bombed man. And he received this recognition only in 2009. The engineer's wife, Hisako, passed away at the age of 88 in 2008, although some sources claim that she lived until 2010 and was then 93 years old. The cause of death was kidney and liver cancer, long-term effects of radiation exposure. Yamaguchi himself also felt the responses of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in the final years of his life. Although deafness in his left ear from the moment of the explosion and in old age, cataracts and leukemia were added to this. In 2009, the engineer learned that he was suffering from stomach cancer. Towards the end of this year, on December 22nd, Yamaguchi met with the director, James Cameron, and writer, Charles Pellegrino. The filmmakers talked with him about a Hiroshima film, but the film didn't end up going into production. But the man himself never found out about this. Less than a month after meeting with Hollywood figures, on January 4, 2010, 93-year-old Tosumu Yamaguchi passed away. Less than a year after the death of the engineer, his experience was the butt of some unsuccessful jokes. On December 17, 2010, the BBC TV channel made Yamaguchi the main character of their comedy program, QI. Kui. Host Stephen Fry amused the audience with questions like, did the bomb fall on Yamaguchi or did it bounce off him? This angered Japanese diplomats, so the program was removed. The daughter of the engineer, Toshiko Yamasaki, also expressed her lack of understanding that a nuclear-armed UK would make such jokes. When talking about Tosumu Yamaguchi, it also was mentioned his mirror image. U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Jacob Besser was the only person to bomb both Japanese cities. He died of natural causes back in 1992. But during his lifetime, he was constantly asked two questions. Does he feel regret and guilt about what he did? And would he repeat the same order if required? Lieutenant Besser did not feel any sense of guilt for the death of more than 100,000 people. Moreover, if he were ordered to repeat a similar operation, he would not hesitate to carry out the task. 
As an excuse, Besser used an appeal to the historical context of 1945, as well as the atrocities of the Japanese at Pearl Harbor. However, for most, there is a significant difference between attacking an American military base and bombing Japanese cities. The U.S. military suffered at Pearl Harbor, but Japan's citizens suffered most of all. However, if you have any opinions, leave them in the comments under this video.